Iceland is stunning, but it is also a degraded landscape covered in deserts, which happen to be expanding day by day. However, something quite unusual has been happening in these deserts. They're turning purple. And this is the work of a rather peculiar plant that has made its mark on the landscape. So this, this is lupin. It's invasive, but it also fertilizes the soil and can play a really important role in reforesting Iceland. I also think it looks really nice and it actually smells pretty good. So it is a really interesting plant, but it has sparked a debate in Iceland. And in this video, we want to tell you all about that story. Heat the looping and love the looping. You are experiencing various emotions. Their Heat. channel, by the way, is linked below. Love. It's well worth checking out. In this video, we'll try to capture the essence of the debate, but the ultimate purpose that we have here is to start a proper conversation in the comments about invasive species and their role. So feel free to jump in. Now let's dive a little deeper into the ecology of this species. Lupinus nutcatensis is a plant from the Lupinus gene, part of the Fabaceae legume family. It is native to North America, more specifically Alaska, and it's easily recognizable by its distinct blue flowery stem. It thrives in sandy and stony soil, and it can even grow in bare gravel. When mature, it can be as tall as 120 centimeters and live as long as 20 years, with the biggest recorded plants having up to 100 stems. To put that into context, a plant with 25 flowering stems can provide up to 2,000 seeds in one season. This means that on flat lands, the lupin can expand approximately 1 to 3 meters every year, but potentially much more on steeper landscapes or through the wind and water streams. And here in Iceland, there are plenty of steep, windy landscapes covered in streams. As you can see, this species has no problem growing and reproducing, but it also has another trick for us. It is a nitrogen-fixing species, but more on this later. Now, let's look at how it got here in the first place. So, this here is Lupinus notcatensis, otherwise known as the sand lupine. And it's actually not native to Iceland. It is a North American plant, which was introduced to the country in 1945. After a trip to Alaska, Hakon Bjarnson, the director of the Icelandic Forest Service at the time, returned home with, and you might not believe me, two spoonfuls worth of Lupinus nutcatensis seeds. That was all it took to get us to where we are today. This was the start of a big change in Iceland. The plant was brought over primarily as a restoration tool. Bjarnason was aware of the plant's nitrogen-fixing capabilities, and he saw the potential of using the plant as a tool to restore Iceland's flora in its largely barren lands. So, as you can see, the soil quality here is extremely poor, and it is exactly this kind of place where the lupin is quite beneficial. Lupin quickly became popular, not only for its restoration utilities, but also for its beauty. In the post-war times, the lupin was also preferred over grass, as it was more economical due to its self-fertilization properties. It is fair to say that for the first 40 years of its existence in Iceland, sand lupine was greeted with open arms. I mean, they even had a door-to-door -door campaign that sold these little elf heads with a birch seed and a lupin seed inside. However, after this honeymoon phase, the debate started to ramp up. But what is it all about? We want to explore the arguments on both sides and try to get a better grip on the subject. So now let's start with the positives. The majority of people are struck by its beauty. The vast fields of blue lupine, which can be seen around midsummer, have become an attraction for both the Icelandic people and tourists alike. Now that we got the obvious one out of the way, let's have a look at how it is changing the landscape. So I'm here in the desert where you can see the perfect example of how lupin is recolonizing this area. So on my right hand side, you can see essentially a large field of lupin. And on the left, you can see the desert and the plants are slowly year by year inching forward and recolonizing this area. And it's really impressive because it's the only plant that is doing this. None of the native plants are doing so. The fertile soil that the lupin creates is quite useful to start planting successfully. It has been proven to bring back a number of invertebrates, such as earthworms, that also have an important role to play in their ecosystem by converting bigger organic matter into humus. No, not hummus, but humus the dark organic matter found in fertile soil. The abundance of earthworms not only helps with the quality of the soil, but it also provides a great food source for a number of birds, making lupin an attractive feeding ground. So it provides a really unique function in stopping desertification. 
And in addition to that, it's laying the groundwork for future forests because it's injecting the soil with nitrogen. And nitrogen is key for many other plant species, including trees, of course, which is how our story begins. In practice, this means that their roots are colonized by bacteria, which will extract nitrogen from the air and fix it in the ground. It is important to note that there are other nitrogen fixers among the native flora, namely Lemus arenarius, a native species of grass, also known as lime grass. However, it is not comparable to the lupine in its ability to colonize new areas. In recent years, there's even been research into the possibility of using the seeds as feed for animals and potentially a food source for humans, as seen with other species of lupine found in southern Europe. I can attest to this because where I grew up in Portugal, people love snacking on termos, which are the seeds of Lupinus albus, as exemplified by my mossy earth team member Diogo who enjoys them with a nice cold beer. Now, before we talk about all the problems with the lupine, you might be wondering, why do we care about it at all? Well, it turns out that the area which we are reforesting here in Iceland is simply covered in it. And this will be a reality in many of our future projects here on this island. So we wanted to gather some opinions. And if that didn't make sense to you, I can explain with our little plug. You see, here at Mossy Earth, we're trying to bring back as much wilderness as we can, and we fund this with our community membership. It's essentially a monthly subscription that restores nature through reforestation in places like Iceland, Scotland, or the Carpathians, as well as a diverse mix of rewilding projects, such as cleaning up fragile cave ecosystems, reflooding wetlands, and even reintroducing wildlife. We have a Discord where you can chat with the team, as well as an app where you can stay up to date with all the work. And, of course, we make videos here on YouTube about our projects. So if you're interested in becoming a member and supporting projects like our project here in Iceland, you can head over to mossy.earth to see what we're all about. There'll be a link in the description and also in a pinned comment down below. Now, let's get back to the lupine. Even though lupine is a great tool for restoration, we must remind ourselves of its negative impact as well. Lupins! Oh, Christ! Like I'm sick of bloody death of them! There are a lot of people in Iceland that don't like the fact that lupine is non-native. And you can add to that list the drastic impact it's having on the landscape and, of course, its risk to native plants. And that is the point we'd like to focus on. Based on aerial footage, there's an estimate that lupine already covers 0.4% of Iceland's land surface. This might seem small, but when you consider that only about 1.5% of Iceland is forested, it puts it into perspective. This is actually an alarming figure, which combined with the exponential growth rate of invasive species could see the plant completely take over the island. This could be really damaging to certain species, such as the European golden plover, which has been negatively impacted by the lupin taking over their nesting grounds in the dwarf shrub heathlands, with blueberry and bilberry being particularly vulnerable. Now, this is a cherished ecosystem and a cherished bird here in Iceland, as every year its migration marks the beginning of the summer. For all its positive effects, it can't be stressed enough that if the lupine expansion is left unchecked and if it's not managed within strict guidelines, Iceland's native flora could be at risk. In our view, this is what needs to happen. Lupine will never be eradicated, so it might be worth using it wherever it makes sense, but controlling it in the areas where it could be damaging and really keeping a good eye on it. So what do you think should happen with the lupine? And what about other invasive species that have a potential benefit to their ecosystem? Please let us know in the comments below. We think that invasives are often a complicated thing to judge. After all, it's just a plant that somehow never managed to get here. And in this case, it's doing such an important job that it's hard to judge whether it should be removed or whether we should just let it spread. There are many stones we've left unturned in this story, but I hope you got a new perspective. Now, if you want to see more about our work here in Iceland, be sure to check out this video right here. Until next time. Cheers!